In this video I will be talking about how to get started with Abacus, particularly in terms of understanding what files are created and where to so store them within the folders on the machine that you're working on. Here are a couple of examples of some most important files that are created. The CAE file, the .CAE file, is the model database file and the ODB file there is the output database file. To be able to share model databases and output databases or indeed Abacus work with others, these are the only two files that you really need but there are other files that you can share and, and if you only receive these files from your collaborator then when you open the CAE file in particular within Abacus you will get an, an error message telling you that there is a journal file missing. We'll describe more about the journal files in the future but in this case I've downloaded these two files that have been shared and they're sitting here in this OneDrive folder which I'll export into a folder just into the downloads area so that we can launch Abacus and, and open those from that location. So here's Abacus for the first splash screen here and this is what you see when you open Abacus. You can see you can start with a standard or explicit model, there are other options, open database, run a tutorial and you can see the recent files there, one of those is that CE database. Initially the work directory should be set as as the first step. Now in this installation of Abacus the default is Simulia backslash commands. Normally that would be C backslash temp which is just essentially a temporary folder on the on the root directory of the hard drive of the machine that you're working from. And so I'm going to change that now to go to temp and here you can see some of the other folders that I've created for work that I've been doing using Abacus in the past. I'll highlight the church bell folder and I can now click OK but we'll then that's specified as the work directory essentially so from now on all the work that I do here if I create a new model database all of the actions that I make while I'm modeling will be stored in files within the work directory here you can see the model database model tree down below and now I can open a database so this would be what would be referred to as the save directory where I save my model database to. Again, I can navigate to the temp folder, open the church bell, and here you can see two model databases. Those, one of those is the one that I've shared in that Teams location and downloaded uh, in a zip file uh, that I'm essentially I'm replicating what somebody else would do if they'd only been given those two files. But we'll have a look at this model database first just to explain some features about it. Here you can see there are actually three models within that model database. I've built one to begin with, Bell Smooth, and then I've right clicked it and done a save as, and then modified those models with Bell Smooth Coarse and Bell Smooth Fine. The differences between Bell Smooth Coarse and Bell Smooth Fine are that I've refined the mesh in each of those two cases. So I've made it coarser or smoother and I've named them accordingly. Here you can see I can drop down from the different models that I have within my model database and choose between them. But in terms of the parts, that they're all the same. So the only differences between these models are, for example, I might have different load cases, different interaction scenarios, and as I've said in my case, a different mesh density. So if we change the context to one of these particular uh, models used in the mesh, uh, in the mesh module, these are where the differences are evident. So that's a coarse mesh version and there's a fine mesh version. It's a bigger it's a bigger model, it takes a while to load when I swap over to it. But there you can see the differences. That's the model database. That's where I would be working from. Now if I go to the downloads folder where I downloaded those two models two that I'd shared in Teams. Here is how I'm accessing that. This is going to be an alternative save directory. So I make that the work directory now, and this is where I'm going to work from. And then I open from, I also, also need to navigate back to that temporary downloads folder. And in the downloads folder here, within the OneDrive, open my model database. This is the same 
model database is the one that I've had open here. Now this is the warning that we get in the case that there's no journal file being shared with it. A journal file is something that allows you to recover the work that you've done in the event of a crash of Abacus. It's, it's really helpful. It basically captures every click, every button press, every, every piece of information that I enter as I build my model so that if I forget to save it or I don't save it before a crash, I can open the journal file and it will essentially recover the work that I did or most of it up to the point of the crash. It's being saved all the time as soon as we start doing anything within our model database. So that was the warning I got that there's no journal file. Otherwise you can see that the model database is, is, is exactly the same as the other one as expected. If I go into that folder you can see some of the other files that get created. There's a message file there, there's a DAP file, there's an input file, a .inp. All of these different files are created during the modeling process and there's documentation from Abacus as to when those different files get created. You can see that there are lots of files in here. I've got files related to different jobs and there's some replay files there, the .rpys. These are also useful files that capture the work that I've been doing when I'm modeling. Just looking back up to that church bell folder, some different models that I've run, different jobs, and I can find that CAE file and there you can see associated with it the journal file just below. So when I open it from my work directory uh, or the save directory, they, they can be the same location. I don't get that error message that I had when I've shared just the CAE database with someone else and they open it without the journal file. Within the model database here you can see these are the jobs. So I've in this case got one job for each of the models. That doesn't have to be the case. I can have multiple jobs for one model or multiple models and only one job. Um, these jobs have each been created. Uh, when you create a new job you choose which model it is that you're creating it with respect to and it lives or sits within the model database. There's some quite interesting capability with jobs and if the if there's some results available, i.e. if there's an output database associated with that particular job in the same location, i.e. in the work directory, sorry, in the save directory in this location downloads, as was the case for this particular, these, this particular results, then I can open it. If I go to this one, you can see that I get an error message because in that location, this output database, this ODB, cannot be found. Okay, so of, of the three jobs, I've just got one of them available and if I go to visualization which is where I interpret the results you can see I can select from whatever output databases are loaded. I've only got one loaded here and I also get to see the three model files but if I select one of those other models it will take me back into the modeling section instead of the results section. I can drill into the model the output database here you can see smooth underscore fine. Within that will be a, a tree that is specific to the way I've created my model and built the job. I have used often or it's recommended to use the job monitor when submitting a job to the solver. We can submit a job to the solver either on the local machine or we can create an input database and submit that for example to an HPC. This is especially useful if we're using a student edition where we have a thousand node limit, we can't submit those jobs to the solver, but we can potentially build a model with more than a thousand nodes, create the input deck, and send it to another machine for solving where the solver doesn't have that limitation. So that's the input deck, write input uh, option there. Now it's busy writing an input deck in my work directory that I can, as I say, submit to a solver either using either using CAE or for example using a command prompt using Abacus command which is another option for the submission of input decks. So there are three stages to modeling, uh, finite element modeling. We have pre-processing which is building the model database, assigning material properties, geometry, material properties, load cases, meshing etc. That's pre-processing. Then we solve, we send the, we create the input database, the .imp and send it to the solver. That happens largely without our intervention. 
The third stage is called post-processing. That's when we have our output database from the solver, the ODB, and we open that in a post-processor. In this case, Abacus CAE is both pre- and post-processor, but we use the model tree for pre-processing and the results tree for post-processing. And um, that, that, those are the three stages. So I can, I can use Abacus CAE to produce the input database, input deck as it's referred to, and send that for solving. Once that's complete, I get the output, the ODB back. Here you can see some of the options for uh, running Abacus, the batch files for CAE, the batch files for visualizing, visualization, and abacus.bat is the command prompt window that is uh, where I can submit the input database. So I just randomly enter some numbers here, but I can define the input deck to use to go to the solver and that will happen you know, without having CAE running at the time. And that will happen in a background process and ultimately deliver me the output database, which I can open in visualization for interpretation. So here's my output database, here's my model tree. What I should also do here is have a look at inside of the output database, you can see that I've got various steps. So this was an eigenvalue linear perturbation analysis. I've got 20 frames in there because I requested as, as the step, the eigenvalue step, 20, the first 20 resonant frequencies. I can also request frequencies within a range between 0 and 5 kilohertz, for example. Each of those frames is one modal, uh, one, one, one mode. The first six for a free-free analysis are always the rigid body modes, three rotations and three translations. Mode seven, therefore, uh, is the first bending mode or dynamic mode. If I turn off the edges so we can see that a little bit more clearly here, you can really nicely see an exaggerated shape. The exaggeration is given by the um, the the scaling we can we can apply a scaling it auto calculates the scaling for each of these frames and we can step through them one by one by double clicking them in the results tree and you can see as we get increasing in frequency the frequencies given in the display um, 884 hertz it's also given as as we hover over the frame it tells us that this is frame 15 for example is a 1170 hertz or cycles per time that's the frequency of that mode shape. This is a symmetrical, axisymmetrical structure. So we have split doublets. We have pairs of modes that are rotated about the axis. Um, I can animate these modes. Um, I can change the animation properties to loop, to do a full cycle. I can make the number of frames greater so I can have uh, more, like a, like a more, Number of, larger number of frames, so better temporal resolution in the animation. At the moment, it's not rescaled properly, the, the, the scale there. So uh, when it calculates the new shape, it would need to apply the rescaling. Scaling got fixed, so everything was black when it got below a certain value. Now we select a different animation type and we get the scaling recalculated. We can control the scaling. We can control many, many things. I can also animate through all of the modes using this feature here so you can see it's scanning through now from modes one uh, well mode zero which is the underformed state through one to six which are the rigid body modes three rotations three tra three translations into modes uh, into the dynamic modes frame seven eight nine through twenty in this case I can export these animations as a video I can split slow them down for example, just to allow me a bit more time, now it's gone back to just animating one particular frequency. You can see the scale factor is progressing from minus one to one. And I can export these videos to, for example, an AVI. So if I go to the annotate drop down on the top taskbar, I can do a save as and I can enter the name of the file and change the options from AVI to QuickTime. I can turn on and off viewports, etc. And there are many, many more things that I can do with uh, Abacus in terms of the visualization of these modes. I hope that was a useful video. We'll be doing more on that in the future. Thank you.